Hello friends, welcome back. I am Pushpendra Singh, and uh, we are going to start the current affairs. So today we are thirty first of May two thousand twenty one, and uh, as you know that these lectures are based on uh, the current affairs portion, uh, and we are referring the two national newspapers, the Hindu and the Indian Express. You could also refer to the national newspapers, and you can supplement your profession with the current affairs. Right, and these lectures are entirely based on the current current affairs. So you can subscribe uh, our channel on the YouTube that is Peter I S Bodies Lectures. Okay, so let's begin with the lecture. Okay, so first news about Mansur. Mansur, you know, the Mansur term basically came from the Arabic term called Mawsam. Okay, which is also known as the seasonal reversal of the rains. They are also known as the seasonal reversal of the rain. So every year the Mansur basically arrives in the Indian subcontinent, specifically on the tip of the Indian Peninsula. Right at at Kerala, every year, say uh, at the first of June, right, and as it was predicted by the Indian Meteorological Department as well as other weather forecasting, you know, agencies. So this year, the Indian Meteorological Department have predicted that the monsoon have delayed a little bit, right? It has delayed to June three because of some specific or some scientific criteria that has that has not been met for the purpose of this onset of the monsoon or the arrival of the monsoon. Okay, and uh, the agency last month has said that the monsoon onset would be on the May thirty first, right? That is almost on the same day. But now it is saying that the monsoon has delayed a bit. The another agency or another private weather forecasting agency called SkyMet has also said that the monsoon have already arrived, already arrived, right? So the SkyMet, which is a private private weather forecasting agency, have said this because of some some, some sort of a criteria. Right, that has been met. That criteria that has been defined by the Indian Meteorological Department. Okay, now the SkyMet that we are talking about, the SkyMet Weather Service Agency, is basically a private weather forecasting agency. Okay, that provides some sort of a the weather forecasting solutions to uh, to basically to the monsoon. Right, so it was the first first private sector entity to provide the weather forecast and weather graphics to the Indian media since 2003 onward. Okay. Now the criteria that has been set by the Indian Meteorological Department for the purpose of, you know, for the purpose of defining whether the monsoon has arrived or not. Right. The first is basically the rain-bearing westerlies. These rain-bearing westerlies should be there at the minimum depth and with minimum speed. Right. If that criteria is met, right, this is the first criteria. Second criteria is at least that 60% of the of the stations that has been available in the Kerala as well as the coastal Karnataka should report. 2.5 millimeter or more of the consecutive days rainfall after May 10, right? And the third criteria is some sort of a you know uh, outgoing long wave radiation, right? If that certain degree of clouding is there on the in that in the atmosphere, right? Obviously the outgoing long wave radiation would be definitely low, but that should be below 200 watts per square meter, right? Because of it will be intercepted by the clouds, but definitely there will be outgoing you know, long wave radiation will be there. Now, let us understand what are these westerlies. So, these westerlies, basically, what we are talking is also known as the anti trades. Why we are talking these westerlies? Because they are the prevailing winds from, you know, from west to east. That is what they are called westerlies. That means that we are talking the westerlies, basically, or this type of, you know, nomenclature, basically, the direction from which the wind is originating or wind is coming. The wind is coming from the west direction. Definitely, it's coming to the east direction. It is called as the westerlies. It basically flows in the middle latitudes. Middle latitudes, from the Uda, almost 30 to 60 degree north and south, right? So they originate basically high pressure areas. Obviously, the wind is originated from high pressure area to the low pressure area. So you can understand these high pressure areas basically falls in the in the horse latitude areas, and they basically flows towards the polar areas. Okay. So roughly you can say the westerlies refers to you know the zone of the wind where you know the wind basically flows forward from the subtropical high pressure band. Okay. Now these are basically the definitions of the westerlies. Now what we are talking about is uh, outgoing long wave radiation. The outgoing long wave radiation is basically uh, you could measure the amount of energy which is emitted by the earth surface, by the oceans, and by the atmosphere. So it is out outgoing long wave radiation. That means the wavelength, that means the wavelength that we are talking is high, is high, right? 
in that rate in that term we could say that this outgoing long wave radiation is basically radiated or amount of energy which is radiated by the earth okay you know by the earth surface by oceans okay and by atmosphere so that energy have been liberated out to the you know uh, to the environment now this radiative cooling that we are talking by this outgoing long wave radiation is a primary way by which you know the earth system cools it cools down or loses its energy so this balance that we are talking this loss of this energy and energy which gained by this you know this system by the way of you know some sort of incoming solar wave radiation that comes out from the from the sun basically determine you know the heat budget of the earth so it is basically very important parameter to determine the heat budget of the earth okay now if you see this three criteria by set by indian meteorological department okay indicated that except this outgoing long wave radiation other two criteria have already met and based on that the climate has already predicted that the monsoon have already arrived okay last year you know uh, the skymet and uh, imd both have forecasted monsoon and imd and skymet both have forecasted the norm monsoon from june to september this year also okay and uh, this monsoon that we are talking because monsoonal winds are basically reversal winds whenever they came to the indian peninsula they basically converted into the southwest monsoon southwest monsoon but what happens is initially they were in the southern hemisphere as a southeastern monsoonal winds southeastern monsoonal winds okay now what happens is as soon as they cross this equator that is the equator okay or zero degree latitude so as soon as they cross the equator they change the direction from southeast direction to the southwest directions so that is something that phenomena occurs somewhere near by equator okay but you must understand that the onset that we are talking about the first wave that occurs over south andaman sea because it is it is locating much before the indian peninsula right and then monsoonal wind then advance across the bay of bengal then reach to the other parts of the country also right so here the monsoon basically have arrived within the error margin right definitely there is forecasting agencies are not something god but definitely they can forecast but there will be some chances of the error also in that forecast okay next tianzhou cargo spacecraft this is china's delivery guy or china's cargo spacecraft which basically carry you know some sort of a uh, the cargo to the china's uh, space station that china is planning to have from the next year onward so here the china's cargo space spacecraft the tianzhou have you know which is a which is a mark 7 rocket have basically already you know docked to the space station which is under construction in the low earth orbit right this this space station belongs to the china so china has completed or china has reached one step forward right of the completion of this you know the space station which will be you know completed by the end of next year right and uh, that will be a great great development for the china definitely because of such type of you know space station that is being you know uh, you know first of its kind of the particular you know the particular country so that we are talking about the tanjo tanjo 2 is basically a cargo spacecraft which carry cargo to the space station okay now this this is china's ambitious space station that we are talking about that is basically known as tiangong okay so tiangong is basically the name of the space station okay that the china is basically planning to have in the low earth orbit okay in which the international space station is also located okay so first of all let us understand a bit a brief background about it so tiangong that we are talking about is a successor to the previous two space laboratories that china has so that was the previous laboratories that china has was basically the tiangong 1 and tiangong 2 these were the previous space laboratories which was launched in 2011 okay and 2016 but now the china is planning to have this space station entirely right it's built you know it will be built on some sort of a modular design which is similar to the international space station right uh, now you must understand this international space 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 station which is currently operated by the international agencies like usa russia japan canada and european space agency so when this Tiangong space station would be completed, right? It will have a core module and will have the attach of the two laboratories, right? And this core capsule that we are talking about, you know, which is named as Tiane. Tiane means, you know, some sort of a 
the harmony of the heavens which is a, just like the size of the bus right you have seen the bus okay so the core capsule which will be just like a size of bus it contains you know some sort of a life support and control system okay and this core will be the station's living quarter that we are talking about so the core of this tiangong space station will be known as tianhe tianhe it will be basically the habitable area right it will be just like a size of the bus okay and uh, the capsule will be central to the central space station's future operation that we are talking about okay and the tianhe that is basically that we are talking about is basically the fifth of the size of the international space station it is not as the size of the international space station that that the currently is working okay so this tanzo spacecraft which is basically carrying the supplies or carrying the cargo to basically to the space station which is a which is currently under development it will be followed definitely this year itself by another mission or another cargo mission that is tianzo 3 that will further carry you know uh, the another you know cargo to the space station as well as this will be followed by senzo 12 and senzo 30 this senzo 12 and senzo 30 will be you know uh, the astronauts will be, which will be ultimately sent to the china space station that is known as tiangong now you must understand here one thing is that this uh, this uh, this uh, this senzo 12 and senzo 3 which will be you know carrying this astronaut three astronauts so at particular point of the time there is a limited capacity that only this tianhe that we are talking which is a habitable zone of this space station will host only three crew member at a time so that is the limitation with that so definitely it will carry you know these three crew members to the space station that belongs to the china so here you could see the rocket which is known as tianzhou 2 which is a cargo space spacecraft which is a mark 7 rocket right which is basically the long range rocket which is recently been docked with the space station belongs to the china all right next the emergency credit line guarantee scheme okay this emergency credit line guarantee scheme was basically launched by the government of india in order to cope up with the disruption which are caused by the covid-19 pandemic now you must understand that almost every other business across the sectors got affected badly affected because of this covid-19 now in order to provide some relief right some some sort of a emergency credit line guarantee right so this scheme was basically launched so this scheme was basically launched now the earlier version of these schemes was basically you know eclgs 1.0 2.0 3.0 and now 4.0 is also launched now all such schemes were basically associated with the pandemic which is known as the covid pandemic right which is been associated or which is been you know uh, uh, implemented with the backdrop of this covid 19 pandemic so now this emergency credit line guarantee scheme 4.0 version basically provides the 100% guarantee cover to the loans up to 2 crore rupees now why this 4.0 scheme was launched first of all you must understand because we have lot of shortages in terms of the oxygens in our hospitals right so here this emergency direct credit card credit line guarantee scheme would provide 100% guarantee cover to the loans that will be provided by you know the banks or the financial institutions to the hospitals to the nursing homes to the clinics definitely for the purpose of the for the setting up of this oxygen generation plant right the government is promoting this oxygen generation plants right uh, by with the help of this emergency credit line guarantee scheme so that this oxygen generation plant could be set up within the premises of these hospitals now let us understand briefly about you know uh, this emergency guarantee emergency you know emergency credit line guarantee scheme so i will give you the brief background about it so first of all the government has expanded you know uh, this emergency credit line guarantee scheme to help the businesses which are hit by you know the covid uh, covid 19 pandemic so here the the eclgs which aims to provide 100% guarantee coverage to the banks non banking financial companies right other lenders who would basically enable them to extend you know some sort of emergency credit to the business which is hit by the covid 19 so here additional ec lgs assistance will be provided up to 10% of the outstanding outstanding is the loan which is outstanding on february 29 2020 to the borrowers right who were previously covered under ec lgs one one version one version right what was this ec ec lgs one version see ec lgs one was basically launched as a part of the 20 lakh crore covid 19 relief package if you remember prime minister narendra modi came and he basically gave this Called the Art Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan, right? In this, he basically outlined 
ट्वेंटी लैक करोड कोविड नाइनटीन रिलीफ पैकेज इफ यू रिमेम्बर ओके दिस स्कीम एम टू प्रोवाइड यू नो थ्री लैक करोड वर्थ ऑफ कोलिट्रल फ्री यू नो द गवर्नमेंट गारंटीड लोन टू द माइक्रो एंटरप्राइजेस टू द स्मॉल एंटरप्राइजेस वेल एस टू द मीडियम एंटरप्राइजेस अक्रॉस द कंट्री राइट टू मिटिगेट सम सॉर्ट ऑफ ए डिस्ट्रेस विच इज कॉज बाई द कोविड नाइनटीन सो हियर द ई सी एल जी एस वन पॉइंट जीरो वॉज बेसिकली हैविंग वन ईयर मोरेटोरियम पीरियड एंड फोर ईयर रिपेमेंट पीरियड दैट वॉज बेसिकली अप्लाइड फॉर दैट ओके नेक्स्ट नेक्स्ट वॉज बेसिकली सम सॉर्ट ऑफ ए ई सी एल जी एस थ्री राइट सो हियर द करंट सीलिंग ऑफ फाइव हंड्रेड करोड रुपीज फॉर द लोन आउटस्टैंडिंग फॉर द एलिजिबिलिटी अंडर ई सी जी एस हैव बीन रिमूव दैट मीन्स फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ गेटिंग लोन्स अंडर ई सी एल जी एस राइट This outstanding, if you have the outstanding of five five hundred crore loans, that ceiling has now been removed, right? It is subjected to you know the maximum lending limit that is forty percent or two hundred crores, whichever is lower. So now let us understand what is this ECLGS three point zero. So ECLGS three on three point zero. So it was basically in order to support you know the hospitality, travel, and the tourism, the leisure, and the sporting sectors, right? You know which are the most affected sectors, right? the covid-19 pandemic right uh, the government has widened the scope of you know this uh, eclgs scheme so here the eclgs 3.0 the business enterprises in the hospitality travel during leisure and the sporting industries right would be able to avail in this type of credit under the scheme right and this was basically availed in order to expand you know the eligibility of those creditors or borrowers with that particular scheme okay now civil aviation was also added in the under eclgs 3.0 version right so validity of eclgs which was extended to you know 13 september 2021 until the guarantee scheme of that is 3 lakh crore would be issued right so whichever is earlier that will be you know uh, the validity of that scheme so disbursement will be disbursement under the scheme will be permitted up to the 31st of december 2021 okay and here the operation guideline to that regard is basically issued by the national credit guarantee trustee company right which was empowered by the government of india for the purpose of issuing these guidelines all right next edible oils okay as you know that uh, the data which is basically basically coming out from the department of the consumer affairs website you see almost all edible oils their prices have been rise, rising sharply in the recent months or recent months right why you know almost all edible oils be it the coke ground nut oil or you know the mustard oil vanaspati oil soya oil or sunflower oil or the palm oil their prices have been rising the price of the prices between 20% to 50 56% right if you see in the last one year right and uh, that there are a lot of reasons for that first of all the rising definite definite rising of the income right changing the food habits right changing the consumption habits consumption of the edible oils also been affected because of that and moreover the mustard oil is basically consumed in the rural areas but the refined oil like sunflower oil so have been oil are basically very highly consumed in the urban areas so that could be the reason right the the consumption of this edible oil is increased now let us understand uh, some bit you know detailed way in this rise of this edible oil so first of all the data which basically we got from the department of the consumer affairs says that the price have steeply rises related to this cooking oil for example the mustard oil has risen to 170 that was from 1 115 only per liter okay the palm oil have risen to 138 right from 85 sunflower has risen to 175 from 110 okay the vanaspati has risen to 140 from 90 okay and just like a soybean oil have been risen to 155 from just 100 only okay so you could understand that almost all edible oil prices have been rising now what is the main what is the main cause of the rising of this uh, this edible oil prices so first of all india imports almost 65% of this annual requirement of you know uh, the 14.5 billion tons of the cooking oil so india has the annual requirement of around 14.5 billion tons of the cooking oil and india met this annual requirement right Uh, almost 65 percent by imports, okay, and almost 35 percent by domestic production. So you could understand India is dependent, right, on this, you know, on this cooking oil for this, for this import, right. So the international prices are rising definitely, and uh, that was also associated with the rise of the prices in India also. For example, the major producers like Indonesia, Malaysia, Argentina, Ukraine, Russia, which supplies mostly this cooking oil to the India, their prices are rising. so definitely the price in india is also rising so first of all we talked about the palm oil 
palm oil is basically rising because of the shortage in labor supply in specifically in the malaysia the malaysia is basically the, the largest one of the largest producer in in the palm oil so there was shortage of uh, the labor because of you must understand because of covid pandemic and because of other you know uh, discrepancies in this you know in the in the, in the market right uh, and indonesia and malaysia both have both have also you know some sort of a biofuel mandates also which increases some sort of a uh, you know the amount of the vegetable oil which will be mixed with the fuel right in the indonesia as well as the malaysia so they have diverted this you know uh, the amount of the amount of this uh, this palm oil to basically to the mixing of this fuel and that is basically occurring the shortage across the world so you could understand that you know that could be the reason or that was the reason basically if you talk about the soybean oil right it is rising because of the dry weather in the argentina the argentina which is the largest producer or largest exporter of the soybean oil india is also exporting or importing you know the soybean oil from the argentina right so here the higher demand from the major consumers like you know the india and the china as well as the dry weather condition the argentina has lowered down the you know uh, the production of this uh, soybean specifically in there similarly if you talk about the sunflower oils they are rising up because of the drought like conditions in the ukraine and the russia because the ukraine and the russia is basically the largest producer and the exporter of your sunflower right now there is some sort of a drought like conditions there so because of that the the productivity of this edible oils or specifically the sunflower oil what is effective because of all because of that so there are a lot of regions you could also understand that region okay now how an is officer are you know are put on the central deputation so that is you know the central uh, the central uh, officers or the working with the central government or the state government right you know these officers can be put under deputation with the central government right for example recently the west bengal chief secretary bandhu patyay right who is an is officer of the batch of 1987 was due to begin an extension of the three months right the three month extension is given based on certain you know conditions if their conditions are met right but the center is asking to join you know government of india on the deputation okay now there are certain uh, the rules which provide the deputation or the extension of the tenure for example rule 61 of the death come retirement benefit rules of the government of india says that if the member of the service or if the if the person is basically dealing with some sort of a, some sort of a you know the work which is related to the budget or working as a, as a member of particular community right that committee has not been submitted its report or is due to submit its report in the near future so there there you know extension of the service may be extended to the three months or with the but that that will be extension will be given with the prior approval of the central government only okay for the officer who is posted as a chief secretary this extension can be given up to six months okay and uh, what about the central deputation this is a normal practice when the the, the officer which is which is basically working as a all india services like ias ips or ifs officers right they could work on the deputation with the central government right so uh, the central government basically ask every year right uh, the officers who would like to work right on the central deputation right and then the central government basically select those officers for the deputation so here the rule 61 of this ias cadre rule says that an officer which with the concurrence of the state government concerned with the state to the central government would be deputed under the central government or any other state government for the purpose of deputation right if there is a disagreement between say between the state government and the central government right or between the state government right if the concern will be affected right now the decision will be you know uh, uh, would be taken based on the decision which is arrived by the central government in that regard right so the concern would get effect to the decision of the central government with that regard okay so here the chief secretary bandhu patyay who is basically you know uh, uh, impacted because of this type of issue there will be deportation okay next the international space station okay so as you know that international space station is basically a uh, station which is been located in the lower orbit so this international space station has been in the space since 1998 right and uh, it is been basically operated by the five international partners you could say that first of all nasa which is the premier international premier space agency belongs to the usa okay then roscosmos the roscosmos is a premier premier space agency belongs to russia okay then zaxa zaxa is a premier space agency belongs to japan okay then european space agency belongs to the europe okay and then csa belongs to canada 
Okay. Now, what is happening is that the NASA is planning to send, you know, some of the butter bears as well as the bobtail squid, which is a water animal or experimental water animals to the International Space Station. So here, 128 glow in the dark baby squids as well as 5,000, you know, tardigrades, which are also known as water bears, will be sent, right? to the International Space Station for the research purpose. So here, the SpaceX 22nd cargo resupply mission, which will be sent to the International Space Station, would carry these baby squids as well as the water bears to the International Space Station for the purpose of conducting this experiment that could have the scientists to design some sort of an improved protective measures for the astronauts, right, which are going for the long-term duration travel for that purpose. Now, now let us understand about uh, you know this one. So this water beer that we are talking as well as this wobtail squid that we are talking, right, is involved in some sort of a experimental works abroad. Sorry, aboard in the in the floating laboratory that will be located in the International Space Station. So they will be sent to you know uh, to the International Space Station in the semi-frozen state, right? Before that and after that they will be thawed out and they will be revived and grown in the in a special bioculture system in the, in the, in the International Space Station. So this experiment is aimed at to better understanding how this, you know, these beneficial microbes interact with the animals, right? Uh, that potentially basically leading to the breakthrough in improving, you know, some sort of a human health on the earth, okay? So here you could understand that the ISS has been, you know, have been providing that type of, you know, uh, uh, that issue that could basically understand how this breakthrough could understand or breakthrough could improve the human health on the earth. Okay, so here that we are talking about the water bears is basically a tiny animal that is hardly one millimeter long, one millimeter long, long that can adapt to the extreme conditions on the earth, right? Like high pressure, high temperature, high radiation. So how could they behave in the space space flight environment or in the NASA, you know, in the International Space Station? And the second that we are talking about this, you know, uh, this bobtail squid, which is also very, very tiny, that is hardly three millimeter long, right? This beneficial microbes, right? That was a part of the understanding of the microgravity of the animal micro on the animal microbe interactions. Now, here what we are talking about this microbes, you know, that we are talking about this microbe that is, you know, this bobtail squid or you know, this water bear. Why we are talking about this microbes? See, microbes play a very, very crucial role in the normal development okay of the animals like you know like the normal development of okay so microbes what we are talking about sorry sorry for the brief inter interruption that was because of uh, the net connection okay so microbes that is basically you know as you know that play a very very crucial role specifically in the normal development uh, of the animal tissues as well as the maintaining some sort of a human health so here the research will allow the scientists to have you know some sort of a better understanding of the how you know uh, these beneficial microbes would interact with the animals right and there is you know also there is a lack of gravity over there so how could this interaction would help the, the scientists to understand this relationship so in the human body also these microorganisms contribute to the variety of the functions right including digestions developing the immune systems you know uh, some sort of a detoxifying of the harmful, harmful chemicals right so this disruption in our relationship with these microbes can lead to the disease also so that could also be you know one of the potential uh, you know the study you know where this international space station would be conducting for that purpose okay now next is floating jetty so here you must understand the union minister of the ports and the shipping and waterways inaugurated the second floating jetty at old goa in the goa so here the floating jetty that we are talking about what is this floating jetty see floating jetty or the floating pyre is basically a platform or you can say it's a ramp okay that is been supported by the pontoons right so here it is just simply a ramp which is supported by this pontoon so it is usually joined to the shore with a gangway okay and i will show you the diagram don't worry so here the pyre is basically usually held in place by the vertical poles okay and which are referred to the pilings and which are embedded in the sea floor by some sort of a anchored cables okay so here the jetty will offer you know some sort of a hassle free transportation to the tourists definitely the goa is basically one of the best uh, destination for the tourism for the tourist purpose so the minister basically lauded the work which is done by the government of Goa for the purpose of you know, promoting the tourism sector industry. So here the government of India had already you know, approved the setting of these concrete floating jetties on the river Mondovi right, to 
connect the old Goa as well as the Panjim. So this river Mondovi that we are talking about is basically also known as the Mahadai River. It is basically described as a lifeline of the of the you know state of Goa. So it is the second floating jetty which will which will which is constructed on river Mondovi. Okay, earlier you know first jetty was already completed, right? At the captains of the port that is Panjim Goa for the purpose of this promotion of this tourism, specifically in this port. So that is our the jetty that we are talking is basically supported with this pontoons. Okay. Next, Hariru and the Nava genocide. So here, the Hariru and the Nava genocide was basically occurred in specifically in 1904 and 1908. Uh, at that point of the time, the Namibia, which is a basically the African country that was ruled by the Germany, George German colonialists, right? So there, the tribal tribals, which are also known as the Hariru and the Nama. This Hariro and the Nama are basically the two tribal communities that was basically rose in the rebellion against this German colonizers in 1904 and 1905. And thousands of the people or thousands of these tribes belongs to the Hariro and the Nama was basically killed or was basically you know murdered by this uh, German colonizers at that point of the time. Okay, so recently the Germany for the first time have recognized that yes, we have killed, right? It was a genocide against you know. The Harero and the Nama people who was considered as a tribal people, right, in the Namibia and the Namibia and that time, you know, the Germany was basically the, by default the colonial ruler of this Namibia. So here you, would, you must understand that after five years of the death of the negotiations between the Namibia and the Germany, right, to attempt to heal the bounds, specifically, you know, uh, the German foreign minister now recently announced, you know, 1.1 billion pounds of the help that will be provided okay to uh, to the namibia specifically for the purpose of their redevelopment so here what happens is between 1884 and 1890 the germany formally colonized a part of africa okay that africa that was you know the present day you know uh, that basically namibia so obviously that was not that that uh, you know territory but presently that area that was colonized by the by the germany that was basically currently is in Namibia. So the territory which was roughly as a twice as large as the European Union. You could understand that. And in 1903, almost 3000 German settlers basically occupied this central high grounds belongs to the Namibia. Now this this tension be between, you know, this tribal community, specifically this Hariro and the Nama basically rise and the local tribal people basically rose to the uh, to the rebellion specifically to resist, you know, uh, these colonizers which belongs to the Germany. So now what happens is a conflict basically reached to the high and there the rebellion occurs and almost almost you know the Harero Harero tribals basically rose to the rebellion and they were basically the pastoral community that was basically at that point of the time. So the battle of water war was happens between this Harero community and the German people. Almost 80,000 Harero basically pastoral tribes were basically rose in the rebellion and only 15,000 were survived. Almost you could understand 65,000 people perished or the died in this the battle of water war right the german basically continued to rule this region till 1950 when the south africa basically took over the control of you know uh, this area which was belongs to the namibia previously okay and so south africa took the control of the namibia for next 75 years until 1990 so in the 1990 the namibia got independence from basically uh, from basically south africa so you could understand here that was how the horrific is the situation that was that at that point of the time. So here, what we are talking about is political map of the Namibia. So you could understand the Namibia is also known as in the Republic of Namibia is a country in the southern Africa, right? Definitely here you could understand that it is a, it is a border with the you know Atlantic Ocean on the western side. It shared the land border also with the Zambia, okay, okay, and Angola to the north, okay, and also you could understand uh, it also borders with the Botswana. Okay, to the east and the South Africa to the south and the east. Okay, that we are talking also. Okay, so that is the political map. You could also learn, uh, you know, uh, from your entrance also. Okay, next the Surya Kiran. So here Surya Kiran is basically, you know, the aerobatic display team belongs to the Indian Air Force. Right, it has basically attracted, you know, the crowds across the country to have, you know, the special maneuvers that is basically offered in the, in the air for a, as a part of aerobatic display. Right. Uh, and in basically in the in the aircraft in the red and white so it has completed the 25 years of their completion so here the suri current which is the aerobatic team right which belongs to the indian air force 
So here one of the few nine aircraft basically display teams in the world and is the only in the Asia which, which basically practice or which basically follows such type of aerobatic display team in the country. It has carried almost 600 displays across the country in the Southeast Asia. So here what we are talking about this Suri Kiran is basically you know name is basically arose from uh, from the Sanskrit word which is also known as the rays of the sun. Okay. So here you know, uh, it was raised in 1996 as as a as a as a part of you know Indian Air Force and the air base of the Indian Air Force in the Bidar in the Karnataka where the six Kiran MK second train aircraft was basically involved. Now subsequently, you know, it was disbanded after some time, but again it was again you know resurrected in 2015 with the advanced trainer you know Hawk MK 132 aircraft. Now it has been associated with the Indian Air Force. And it was also the brand ambassador of the Indian Air Force. It also has the 52 squadron of the Indian Air Force, which is the youngest fighter squadron, it belongs to the Indian Air Force, which is having the motto is the always the best. Okay, so here you could understand they are performing this aerobatic display. Okay, next, the Habited Guilds. So Habited Guild is basically you must understand is something is it is is a basically uh, you know a group of bird species. That have some sort of a common habitat preference. So it is an ecological term that we call gil. Okay, I'll, I'll let you know. Don't worry this concept. So in the Uttarakhand, which is a basically you know uh, the hilly state, have which is a basically a part of the Western Himalaya temperate forest. Okay, now harbor the large number of endemic world species. This world species that is basically affected because of some sort of changes in the in the basically in the adverse conditions like you know. Uh, the infrastructural development as well as other developmental activities so that was also affected because of these guilds which were belongs to the animals over there so here the Uttarakhand which is basically oak dominated forest is basically affected because of fragmentation of this habitat so six major land use types which were basically included in the in the basically in the Uttarakhand the first is natural oak forest the degraded oak forest you know the low oak forest the pine forest agricultural cultivation area and the sites which are affected because of you know degradation right either because of intensive cultivation right so this this species are also affected because of this monoculture activity monoculture means just you know growing of one particular species of a particular plant right uh, so as well as you know urban development so all these species are basically affected and their and their guilds are also affected because of this land use pattern or land use changes that is occurring specifically in the Uttarakhand area. All right, so that's all for today. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll meet again tomorrow. And be safe. Be at all. Be at all.